welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. In this special six-part summer series, you will hear recordings of papers delivered at the Robert Menzies Institute's conference on the Menzies Ascendancy, Implementing a Liberal Agenda and Consolidating Gains, 1954 to 1961. The conference was held over two days from the 23rd to the 24th of November, 2023. In today's episode of the Summer Series, you will hear from Associate Professor David Lee on the Menzies Government and the Origins of Australia's Open Economy, 1956-61, followed by Associate Professor Selwyn Cornish on R.G. Menzies and the creation of the Reserve Bank Australia, and finally, Dr. Paul Brown on Alec Downer's Immigration Programme. The Hawke government's decisions in the 1980s to float the the dollar, reduce tariffs and redesign industry policy are generally regarded as the crucial moment in Australia's direction to greater economic openness. Less attention has been paid to the um, historical origins of this trajectory during the Menzies years, and this paper will examine the role of Menzies and his government in beginning the transition away from a closed economy oriented towards trade with the United Kingdom and Europe, towards a more open economy that would be increasingly enmeshed in the Asia-Pacific from the 1960s. And crucial to this transition was Menzies' decision in 1955 to merge the Department of Trade and Customs and the Department of Commerce and Agriculture into a unified Department of Trade. So just some background, the Department of Trade and Customs was a foundation department of the Commonwealth. It had the very important task of raising revenue, collecting the proceeds of tariffs on imported goods as well as excises. And as Australia's tariff regime became increasingly protectionist, the Department of Trade and Customs acquired responsibility for protection of industry. The Department of Commerce was established first as the Department of Markets in the 1920s, then Commerce, and then later in 1942, Commerce and Agriculture. And this latter department had responsibility for promoting exports with the aid of a network of trade commissioners. Now, both trade departments were involved in negotiating the Ottawa Agreement of 1930, which established the imperial preferential system under which Australia accorded preferential entry to British manufactured goods in return for Australia getting concessions on its exports to Britain. Now, because of a shortage of dollars in World War II and after, the Chifley Labor government licensed imports from North America in the second half of 1940s, and particularly its licensing of petrol was an important factor in its defeat in 1949. In 1952, the Menzies government was forced by a balance of payments crisis to extend import licensing to cover the full range of Australia's imports. By that time, Australia's exchange rate was fixed under the Bretton Woods regime and the combined effects of the Ottawa system of imperial preference, these are some of the people who negotiated it, Import licensing and fixed exchange rates meant that the Australian economy in the interwar period and into the 1950s was much less open than it subsequently became. Now, in the second half of the 1950s and into the early 1960s, the Menzies government took several decisions that saw Australia take a turn to greater openness The high point of this comes with the 1980s, with the Hawke government, but the Menzies government also, I argue, played a part in its origins. Beginning in 1954 with Sir John Crawford, the redoubtable Secretary of the Department of Commerce and Agriculture, makes some representations to the government about reform of the public service. And his idea was to create a Department of Trade and Industry. It would control virtually all of Australia's external economic relations, both export and import, other than the statutory marketing boards, which were the responsibility of commerce and agriculture and later primary industry when that was created. 
So Menzies and Bill Dunk, the chairman of the Public Service Board, took these cru the crucial decisions to put Crawford's ideas into practice, and it was done by a, a prime ministerial directive by Menzies in 1955 to obviate any bureaucratic obstruction. So the result was that in January 1956, Menzies abolished the Department of Trade and Customs and the Department of Commerce and Agriculture to establish a new unified Department of Trade. Now before 1956, Trade and Customs had responsibility for imports and a generally defensive and protectionist attitude. At the same time, the Department of Commerce and Agriculture had a positive approach to engaging with the world economy in support of Australia's primary exports. And as Boris Shedvin has observed, the new Department of Trade combined elements of both these philosophies. It retained high protection as a cardinal philosophy, but incorporated an aggressive approach to export promotion. And these two strands, contradictory in a way, sat side by side with each other for almost 20 years. Now, one immediate effect of these machinery of government changes was that it facilitated John McEwen, the Minister for Trade, and his new secretary, John Crawford, to negotiate two major bilateral agreements. The first one was to renegotiate the Ottawa Agreement that had been negotiated in 1932. So by this time, uh, the trade relationship with Britain was out of balance and not in Australia's favour, and McEwen and Crawford wanted to renegotiate it both to, to, to make it fairer to Australia, but also to give the government flexibility to negotiate other trade agreements with foreign countries, and particularly with Japan. So this is what happened. Uh, McEwen and Crawford succeeded in negotiating a new United Kingdom Australia trade agreement, which preserved the essence of the, the old system, but, but made it more favourable to Australia, and also had, it, had a clause in it by which Britain would use its best endeavours to, to import more Australian wheat. Now, that didn't happen, but to make up for the loss of wheat trade to Britain, McEwen and Crawford were successful in engineering wheat trade with the People's Republic of China, beginning with a momentous deal in 1960. But crucially, the renegotiation of Ottawa gave the government the flexibility it needed to negotiate perhaps the most important trade agreement of the 20th century, the commerce agreement with Japan. That was the, the reverse of the British agreement in the sense that tra the trade relationship was overwhelmingly in Australia's favour and Australia was discriminating against Japan in a way that posed risks, maybe that Japan would eventually retaliate against uh, Australia's very important exports like wool and wheat. McEwen and Crawford didn't want that to happen, so they convinced Menzies to uh, authorise negotiations with Japan, which led to this momentous uh, Commerce Agreement of 1957, under which both countries extended to each other most favoured nation treatment in tariff and import licensing, while still retaining imperial preferential trade. Now, this is significant because within a short space of time, within a, about a decade, Japan uh, overtakes Britain as Australia's most important foreign market. Now, the other major change in the direct direction of greater openness comes with the Menzies government's decision in February 1960 to abolish import controls. And in this decision, the Treasury and the Department of Trade were, were key players. Treasury was pushing to get rid of import licensing, particularly from 1959, as a counter-inflationary measure. The Department of Trade which had the job now of, of implementing import licensing. And this was one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why Menzies created the Department of Trade, because he didn't trust the Department of Trade and Customs to be able to adequately administer import licensing. He wanted McEwen and Crawford to do it. 
Now, McEwen and Crawford took a more cautious attitude towards this crucial decision to get rid of import licensing. But by the late 1950s, import licensing was becoming increasingly politically unpopular. Retail and business leaders were complaining about it, and there was a degree of corruption evident in its administration. So it's really politically unpopular. It's bringing heat on the government. The Treasury is pushing to uh, get rid of import licensing, but Treasury wants to, to keep flexibility to have import licensing as an economic lever in case the balance of payments gets out of hand. So eventually, McEwen, perhaps tired of the political headache it's giving, given him, agrees with Menzies and the Treasurer Harold Holt to, t uh, to take the decision to um, abolish import licensing. And so this decision is taken in February 1960 against the advice of John Crawford, who's by this stage transitioning out of the public service and into academia. With Crawford out, McEwen uh, agrees uh, to go along with the decision. So this decision is taken in February 1960, and John Stone, a Treasury official then, said this about the decision. He said the decision to get rid of import licensing was part of a process dealing with a sort of inflationary upsurge that began to occur in 1959 and led to this decision in February 1960 um, to abolish almost at a stroke import licensing in order to basically make goods more freely available and hence to cut back the inflationary consequences of the kind of protectionism involved in that import licensing regime. And in the 50s, import licensing was the more important protection measure than the tariff. After 1960, the tariff regains that position. John Stone goes on to say, I think it was one of the most important decisions in the post-war period because it really was a kind of watershed in putting the war behind us. It might seem strange putting the war behind you after 15 years after the event, but that is actually what happened. So abolishing um, import licensing was a brave decision rather like the decision of the Hawke government to float the dollar in 1983. And both decisions resulted in economic trouble for the governments, which made them. Hawke's government oversaw a precipitate decline in the value of the dollar, while the Menzies government, as Crawford and others predicted would happen, oversaw a balance of payments crisis that had to be addressed by drastic credit squeeze measures. And, and these credit squeeze measures were one of the factors that led to Menzies' near defeat in 1961, which we've heard about already. But again, one of the consequences coming out of the credit squeeze crisis was government searching for all possible means to increase exports. And one of, out of this casting around for, for ways to increase exports were decisions to end the iron ore export embargo in 1960 and to subsidise Australia's coal ports. So the iron ore ban is lifted in 1960, less because of him, I think, than because of agreement within the Menzies government and the major departments like trade and national development. And also to subsidise Australia's coal infrastructure in ports like Balmain and Newcastle and Port Kembla and also Gladstone in Queensland. So that in the 1960s, we have the beginning of the mining boom, which helps to transform the Australian economy and to bring new staple exports like iron ore, coal and bauxite. So in the 1960s, Australia became free of the kind of balance of payments crises that had bedeviled Australia in the 40s and 1950s. Now, in this tussle, Treasury often cast itself as the, 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 the hero of the story and trade as the protectionist villain. And here's what one Treasury official said of this tussle. He says, the ironic result was that the Treasury operated as the Department for Trade e.g. in persuading the government to abolish import licensing in 1960, and trade as the department against trade, e.g. in conceiving and winning support for local content plans. Uh, 
I would argue that if Treasury had been less influential, Australia might have clung to import licensing for its manufacturers as New Zealand did, and that if trade had been less influential, Australia might have participated more fully in the great expansion of trade between industrialised countries which occurred in the 1950 to 70 period, thereby experiencing a more rapid growth in living standards and faster progress towards a more adaptable and resilient economy. Now, I think this is unfair, this characterisation of trade and particularly Crawford as, as villains. And we can see later in 1973, for example, that the trade was more favourable to Whitlam's 1973 tariff cuts than an opposition as Treasury was. But it's, it's certainly the case that key decisions made by the Menzies government in this period, 1950. Uh, 6 to 1961, formation of the Department of Trade, the two uh, trade agreements with Britain and Japan, ending import licensing and the measures to promote mining must be taken in, in account in, in, into a full account of Australia's post-war move from the sheltered economy of the first half of the 20th century to a more open economy oriented in the Asia-Pacific in the period from the 1960s onward. Thank you very much. My paper uh, concerns the decision by the Menzies government in April 1957 to separate the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank. This decision led to the passing of legislation in April 1959 to create the Reserve Bank as Australia's central bank. Menzies' uh, involvement in the creation of the Reserve Bank has, in my estimation, been understated by historians of central banking. At first, Menzies opposed separation. But by 1956, he was having second thoughts. And by April 1957, he was convinced that a separate central bank should be established. S.J. Butlin and C.B. Shedvin, in their histories of central banking in Australia, scarcely mention Menzies' involvement in the separation of the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank and the creation of the Reserve Bank. Alan Martin only briefly refers to the issue in his two-volume biography of Menzies. Now, decisions to terminate the commercial banking operations of central banks are often regarded as signal events in the evolution of central banking. Charles Goodhart, the leading British authority on the history of central banking, declared that, quote, it was the metamorphosis from their involvement in commercial banking as a competitive profit-maximising bank among many to a non-competitive, non-profit-maximising role that marked the true emergence and development of proper central banking. I want to spend a bit of time um, going over some historical background regarding this issue, because the issue of separating the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank uh, doesn't suddenly arise in the 1950s. It goes right back, um, actually, to the 1890s. The Reserve Bank Act, passed in April 1959, resolved an issue that had been debated since the Depression in Eastern Australia in the 1890s, with the collapse of many banks, particularly in this city, and the loss of savings that had been deposited in banks. There was a desire for the creation of a government-owned bank that would guarantee the security of bank deposits. Such a bank might be a government-owned competitor to the private commercial banks, offering perhaps a deposit guarantee uh, to its customers. An alternative was a central bank, similar to those established in some European countries, of which the Bank of England was the exemplar. Such a bank would act as the lender of last resort 
to the banking system with the object of providing stability to the financial system. Yet another possibility was a composite government-owned commercial bank and central bank. Such a bank might provide a, a deposit guarantee to its commercial customers while acting as the lender of last resort to the banking system. In other words, a combined commercial bank and central bank. The uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia was established in 1911 by the Fisher Labor Government. And when it was established, it was established as a government-owned trading and savings bank, having no central banking functions other than banker to the Commonwealth Government. But during the next four decades, it acquired an extensive array of central banking functions. It floated loans for the government during and after the First World War. It took responsibility from 1920 for the printing and issuing of currency notes. From 1924, trading banks had to settle their interbank clearances through accounts held at the Commonwealth Bank. During and after the depression of the 1930s, the Commonwealth Bank managed the exchange rate and began to exert an influence over the determination of interest rates. Additional central banking functions were assigned to the Commonwealth Bank during the Second World War when a number of direct controls were introduced for the purpose of conducting monetary policy. In other words, the Commonwealth Bank evolved from a government-owned commercial bank into a composite commercial bank and central bank. However, the development of the Commonwealth Bank as a composite commercial and central bank didn't accord with advice that it received from the Bank of England regarding the principles of true central banking. Lacking experience in operating a central bank, the Commonwealth Bank sought advice in 1926 from the Bank of England. Its governor, Montague Norman, was invited to visit Australia with the object of explaining how the Commonwealth Bank could function as a central bank. He declined the invitation because of a busy work schedule. Instead, he suggested that Sir Ernest Harvey, one of the Bank of England's most senior officers, should go to Australia in his place. In the meantime, Norman provided the Commonwealth Bank with a list of principles of central banking for the Commonwealth Bank to consider. One of the principles, in fact, the first principle on Norman's list was, quote, a central bank should not compete with other banks for general business. Another principle was that, quote, a central bank should be the banker of all other banks in its own country. Well, the Commonwealth Bank was clearly not conforming to these and several other of Norman's principles of central banking. For a start, the Commonwealth Bank was heavily involved in the provision of commercial services, in effect competing against the private trading banks for business. Nor was it acting as a banker's bank. This involved the private trading banks maintaining their reserves at the Commonwealth Bank, which could be then drawn upon by the central bank for the purpose of shoring up commercial banks experiencing runs on their deposits. Harvey um, arrived in Australia in 1927 and spent much of his time uh, discussing with the government, including the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, senior staff of the Commonwealth Bank, private bankers, business leaders and state officials, how the Commonwealth Bank could function as a central bank. In an address to the Victorian branch of the Economic Society of Australia in April 1927, he asserted, quote, that the first object to which a central bank's efforts should be directed is not the making of profits, but service to the country. It should refrain from doing any business capable of involving it in liabilities which may restrict its freedom, its freedom of action in the discharge of its true central banking functions. He agreed with Norman that, quote, a central bank should not ordinarily compete with the trading banks for general banking business. And he insisted that, quote, the trading bank's reserves should stand to their credit on accounts opened by them with the central bank. 
After Harvey left Australia, the Commonwealth Bank engaged in negotiations with, private trade, with the private trading banks. A topic of conversation was that the trading, trading banks should maintain their reserves with the Commonwealth Bank as the central bank. But the banks refused, arguing that the Commonwealth Bank, being their major competitor, could not be trusted with their reserves. It was likely the banks contended that the Commonwealth Bank would use the reserves to compete against them. In an attempt to induce the banks to change their minds, they were assured that the Commonwealth Bank would not compete aggressively against them. And furthermore, the Commonwealth Savings Bank would be provided with its own statutory authority, thereby allowing a degree of separation between it and the central banking activities of the Commonwealth Bank. But again, the banks rejected the idea on the grounds that the Commonwealth Bank was not only the central bank, but also a commercial bank in competition with them for business. To leave their reserves with the Commonwealth Bank, they argued, would give it a, comparative advant a competitive advantage. In uh, 1929, the Labor Party, led by James Scullin, won the federal election. And in May 1930, the Treasurer, E.G. Theodore, introduced a bill into the Parliament to establish a separate central bank, to be called the Central Reserve Bank of Australia. The commercial functions of the Commonwealth Bank would remain with the Commonwealth Bank, which would revert to being a government-owned commercial bank. Theodore stressed that the principal object in creating a separate central reserve bank was that the private banks would not agree to keep their reserves with the Commonwealth Bank because it was a competitor of the private banks. In the event, the proposed legislation to create the Central Reserve Bank of Australia as a separate central bank was passed the lower house of the federal parliament where the government commanded a majority, but it failed to pass the Senate, which was dominated by the opposition parties. Following the 1934 federal election, the coalition government led by Joseph Lyons established a royal commission to report on the monetary and banking systems at present in operation in Australia. It strongly supported the further development of central banking in Australia, and it strongly supported the retention of the composite nature of the Commonwealth Bank, arguing that the commercial functions of the Commonwealth Bank assisted its central banking operations. By adjusting interest rates on its commercial deposits and loans, the Royal Commission asserted that the Commonwealth Bank could influence monetary conditions and ultimately the level of economic activity. It concluded that, and I quote, the present structure of the Commonwealth Bank, consisting as it does of a central bank with trading bank powers and a savings bank, is, in our opinion, essential to the efficient exercise of its functions as a central bank. While it, con while it conceded that, quote, it is unusual for a central bank to carry on trading bank activities and to control a savings bank, we consider it essential that the Commonwealth should do both. Through its trading bank activities, it possesses powers of competing with the trading banks which can be exercised as and when required. We are of the opinion that the use of its trading bank activities as an adjunct to central banking policy is in keeping with its central bank functions and is to be approved. After the release of the Royal Commission's report, um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the government uh, engaged um, in uh, consultations with the private banks to try and get them to, to leave their reserves uh, with, uh, on deposit uh, at the Commonwealth uh, Bank. But again, the banks refused on the grounds that the Commonwealth Bank was not only the central bank, but their major competitors. When the ALP came to office, it in uh, October 1941, 
It didn't bother to seek the approval of the private banks to maintain their reserves uh, at the Commonwealth Bank. Instead, it invoked the special wartime provisions of the Australian Constitution to force the banks to lodge up to 100% of the increase in their assets in special accounts held at the Commonwealth Bank. This and other direct controls, including interest rate controls on bank deposits and loans and controls limiting bank lending, were continued after the war through the 1945 Commonwealth Bank Act and the 1945 uh, Banking Act. Following the war, the trading bank activity of the Commonwealth Bank experienced a significant rise in its share of total bank deposits and advances. In fact, within 12 years to 1959, the Commonwealth Bank almost doubled its share of total trading bank deposits. The private banks responded by claiming that this expansion was due to the Commonwealth Bank not being subjected to many of the direct controls imposed on the private banks for monetary policy purposes. The special accounts procedure in particular, but also interest rate, lending and liquidity controls. As a result of the seemingly favourable situation enjoyed by the Commonwealth Bank, the private banks began to agitate for the separation of the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank, enlisting the support of the various bank officers associations, chambers of commerce, the press and Liberal Party backbench members of the federal parliament. The Commonwealth Bank, led by the Governor, by its Governor, Dr H.C. Coombs, strongly resisted calls for separation, arguing that the commercial operations of the Commonwealth Bank strengthened its central banking responsibilities, quoting the 1930s Royal Commission to support his case. As the calls for separation grew louder through the early 1950s, Coombs advised the government that the commercial activities of the Commonwealth Bank could be separated from the central banking functions without the total separation of the bank's commercial and central banking functions. The trading bank function, uh, for example, could be provided with its own body corporate and general manager, with the Commonwealth Bank retaining its single board of directors and common staffing arrangements. The Prime Minister supported Coombs, and so did the Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer Sir Arthur Fadden, the leader of the Country Party. In 1953, the Commonwealth Bank Act was amended along the lines that Coombs had recommended. The name of the trading bank function of the Commonwealth Bank was changed from the General, Ma General Banking Division to the Commonwealth Trading Bank and was given a separate statutory authority, a similar arrangement to that provided in 1928 for the savings bank activities of the Commonwealth Bank, which had been renamed the Commonwealth Savings Bank. Steps were also taken to ensure that the Commonwealth Bank was subjected to the same direct controls as the private trading banks, including the special accounts procedure. With these developments, it was argued that the private banks could no longer legitimately claim that they were being subjected to unfair competition by the Commonwealth Bank. However, the compromise worked out in 1953 soon came under renewed attack by the advocates of separation, especially uh, by the private trading banks aided and abetted uh, by the Fairfax uh, Press, uh, particularly the uh, Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and an increasing number of Liberal Party backbench members of par Parliament holding um, seats in, in and around Sydney. Coombs, on the other hand, was adamant that the Commonwealth Trading Bank was not competing unfairly against the private banks, pointing out that the Commonwealth Trading Bank was now subjected to the same set of direct controls as the private banks and that the special accounts procedure had been modified to ameliorate the concerns of the banks. Menzies, uh, by the end of 1956, 
was beginning to think that the demands for separation had reached a point where serious consideration had to be given to the complete separation of the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank. In February 1957, he met with the heads of the private banks, the leadership of the Commonwealth Bank and senior Treasury officials to review the grounds for separation. In early April 1957, Fadden informed Coombs that it was now almost certain that separation would be endorsed by the government. While Menzies, according to Fadden, agreed that, and I'm quoting Fadden, agreed that it would be in the best interests of all concerned that there should be no new banking legislation, he was certain that it was not practicable to have this view accepted by the Cabinet or the Liberal and Country parties, and that for him, the Prime Minister, to express this view publicly or in a way which would become public would split the, Labor, uh, would split the Liberal Party and irreparably damage the government. Fadden added that he, uh, the Prime Minister, was convinced that, and I'm quoting Fadden again, that he, the Prime, the, the Prime Minister, was convinced that unless there was a separate board for the Commonwealth Bank and Trading Bank, the advocates for separation would not believe that effective action was being taken and that the issue would remain a source of dissension. At a Cabinet meeting on the 3rd of April 1957, there had been general, though not unanimous, support for separation. It was agreed, however, that the Prime Minister should make the final decision. At a subsequent Cabinet meeting on the 9th of April, the decision was taken to proceed with separation. And the following day, Menzies issued a press statement outlining the government's proposals, including the creation of a separate central bank. The legislation to create the Reserve Bank was introduced into the Parliament in late 1957 uh, by the Treasurer, Sir Arthur Fadden. It passed through the House of Representatives without great drama, although the ALP opposed all 14 separation bills, largely on the grounds that separation would weaken the Commonwealth Bank. But the coalition parties lacked a majority in the Senate. This became clear when the two Democratic Labor Party senators and the single Queensland Labor Party senator announced that they would be voting with the ALP to oppose separation. This meant that the government and the combined opposition in the Senate, the ALP, the DLP and the QLP, now commanded an equal number of votes, the, the, the government and the, and the combined opposition. And of course, uh, a tied vote meant a negative outcome and the legislation failed to pass the Senate in late 1957 and again in early 1958. The government could have sought a double dissolution of the parliament, but a general election was due by the end of 1958 and it was decided to wait until the election at the end of the year. The election held in December 1958 resulted in majorities for the government in both houses of parliament, a, a stunning victory uh, for the coalition uh, parties. Fadden uh, chose not to contest the 1958 election to retire uh, at that point and was replaced as treasurer by Harold Holt, who introduced the banking bills that had been presented to Parliament in 1957 and again in 1958, and the bills were approved by both Houses of Parliament in April 1959. But because of the amount of administrative work that still had to be undertaken, including the division of staff and physical assets between the Reserve Bank and the Commonwealth Banking Corporation, it was not until the beginning of 1960 that the separate institutions began operations. The Reserve Bank opened for business on the 14th of January 1960. Now, um, assessments of the outcome of separation 
have been large, were, were largely positive. SJ Butlin later wrote that, quote, the Reserve Bank modified and improved its techniques and its use of them, free of recurrent embroilment in fights over its existence, structure and role. C.B. Shebin concluded that the beneficial effects of separation exceeded expectations. Almost immediately, banking disappeared from the political agenda. Even the Labor Party soon came to accept that separation had not diminished the central bank's power and that no benefit could be derived from reintegration. As for Coombs, he admitted that, and I'm quoting from his autobiography, the change brought me relief from the problems of reconciling different if not conflicting purposes. It meant that a source of irritation between me and my colleagues on the one hand and our banking clientele on the other was removed. And to be truthful, its removal was followed by a significant improvement in our working relationships with the private banks. I was able to devote my whole energies to central banking issues. Well, to conclude uh, very briefly, several forces were responsible for the separation of the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank. The private trading banks were relentless in their determination to see, separate, see the separation of the Commonwealth Bank's commercial and central banking functions, arguing that they were experiencing unfair competition because the major competitor, the Commonwealth Trading Bank, was part of the same institution as the nation's central bank. The leading newspapers, especially the Sydney Morning Herald, supported the trading banks and their case for, special, uh, for separation. Several backbench members of the Liberal Party, particularly those with electorates in and around Sydney, were also influential advocates of separation. Uh, the Bank of New South Wales was a heavy promoter of the criticism of uh, the combined uh, central banking and commercial banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank. Menzies' role in the government's decision to support separation was crucial. No doubt he was conscious of the growing support for separation from traditional supporters of the Liberal Party, including the private banks and the metropolitan press. There was also the strong and increasing support from backbench members of the Liberal Party and Menzies was not prepared to allow them to destabilise the government. Above all, it was Menzies' political acumen that led him in the end to support separation and the creation of the Reserve Bank as a standalone central bank. In a broader sense, it seems that Menzies believed that history was determined principally by the ideas and actions of individual men and women. He dismissed, for example, Marx's economic or materialistic interpretation of history. Writing to the Oxford historian A.L. Rouse in August 1958, Menzies revealed that he had, and I'm quoting Menzies' letter to Rouse, he had, quote, long since come to the conclusion that Diogenes was right and that at all stages and under all circumstances we must look for a man. Cameron Hazelhurst, in his biographical study of Menzies, declared that, and I quote, as long ago as 1934, Sir Robert himself wrote approvingly of what he called a new historical method, which would, quote, bring the great men and women of earlier days so near to us that while their heroic proportions may be occasionally diminished, their actual existence becomes credible and significant. In the case of the separation of the commercial and central banking functions of the Commonwealth Bank uh, that happened at the turn of the 1950s, uh, and hence the responsibility for creating the Reserve Bank of Australia, the man, it would appear, was Menzies himself. At least that's my interpretation. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Menzies of the well, uh, members of the Menzies family, and uh, former High Commissioner George Brandis. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, this quote I'm going to put up on the board. I would ask you just to read it 
think about it for a minute. Ask yourself the question, maybe who said this? Because it's critical to my talk today. What's probably counterintuitive about the, uh, the immigration program of the Menzies government, particularly under Alec Dada, who was immigration minister in the late 1950s, is that there was a lot of opposition to change to uh, improve the white Australia policy, to humanise it, to remove the dictation test in 1958. And um, to understand it, there's sort of two fundamental historical assumptions, what Dennis Needham calls assumptions felt as facts. I love this phrase, assumptions felt as facts of the time. It's a bit like presentism now. Presentism says, well, everything that is now is what it was then. So you will just judge people by today's values of progressive values of identity politics back in the 50s when it was a largely uh, Anglo population, rightly or wrongly, that was the reality. And we have to deal with that. Histori historians have to deal with that. Not make moral judgments about the past, but understand what was the context and what were the reasons for that. And two of the most important concepts were Britishness or British race patriotism, what um, Deacon called being independent Australian Britons. I think George wrote about that once. Being independent Australian Britons. In other words, how do we be British as Australians? Uh, what W.K. Hancock called being in love with two soils. Beautiful phrase. Being in love with two soils. And this was the way for many, many Australians. And to understand immigration, you, we need to understand some of these assumptions felt as facts. The second part of it is understanding within the context of the Downers, and I was fortunate enough to do my doctorate on the Downer family and their influence upon Alexander Downer. As you know, John Downer, twice Premier of South Australia, Alec Downer, uh, Minister of Immigration, 58 to 63, and High Commissioner to, to, uh, for Australia to England, followed by his son, in the, he was in 64 to 72. But the family credo was really one of nation building, and it was conceived through larger immigration and through international relations. So all the downers were committed to this, and still are, Georgina, in your electoral speech. So this is the way ahead for a family credo. One of the few family dynasties, I hate to use the word dynasty in Australia, but what's another one? The Anthony's, but there aren't many. So it's great to see this, these values. And um, I'm indebted to Dr. David Kemp for bringing this to my attention, the power of credos in giving mores and values behind policy. Because this is a clue to understanding policy. David said to me recently, Paul, it's not right to think about uh, Menzies as a philosophy, but more to understand the credos behind the policy. I think that's a very insightful comment. So Alec Downer's career began as Minister of Immigration in that period, 1958, and uh, he pursued broadening sources of Australian immigration uh, by, uh, given he had a strong commitment to the, to the white Australia policy. But these changes were to be given uh, expression incrementally. And uh, the assertion that Alec Downer made changes to the policy needs to be evaluated against the backdrop of the Migration Act, which he sought to reform. He didn't want to remove um, the White Australia policy, but he wanted to get rid of the archaic mechanism of the dictation test, which said that unless you were able to speak English, basically, you couldn't come into the country, which is morally repugnant, I think, even t t today. So he said, we can't have this. We must remove this archaic mechanism. Everett said at the time, we must keep it in reserve. And I'll show you a quote. So this quote here, which we're looking at here, is by Leslie Halen, who worked with Chifley in 1946. He went to Norway because they, well, they wanted blondes first. It was an, an academic, uh, academic article called Chifley Preferred Blondes. I think that's a great title for, a, for an article. Uh, but basically, what did Norwegians, Northern Europeans, we couldn't get them, so we had the Southern Europeans come. But this statement here shows the reversal of the Labor Party. This is like Leslie Halen saying that British migrants are preferable at all times. And well, I will argue briefly today, we don't have a lot of time, that the main opposition from, to, to Alec Downer's strengthening of the white Australia policy came from 
the, the Labor Party. It dropped its 1947 commitment to Southern European immigration at the 1958 conference and said we will no longer support Southern European immigration. We must go back to this quote here, more British migrants, because they follow the British way of life and they understand Australian life. No, I, I didn't know that until I started researching it. Why aren't we told these things? Why aren't we told that the Labor Party dropped what Chifley had made famous for the Labor Party, that is to broaden the, the, beyond the British migrant source to uh, Southern Europeans and provide alternative sources uh, for the growth of Australia to build a big, big nation? Now, also, within the Act, Alec Downer sought to change a lot of the anomalies, such as what is known now as the Emigration Act. If you were an Australian Aborigine in 1958, you could not leave the country without the permission of the government. Consider that for a moment. If you're an Indigenous person, you could not leave the country without the permission of the government. And, and Downer abolished that. What do you call that? I don't know. Is it progressive conservatism or is it a change being started to being authorised by the community? Because what's so paramount in understanding, I believe, Menzies and Downer and change in this period, this long period of government, is they would not make changes until they were authorised by the community elections, which is the model for Burkean and conservatism which is the model for sustained success of the Menzies government because he didn't move ahead like Whitlam too far ahead of where people were. And you make changes incrementally. So what you do is you make reforms and the reforms that were made were made in areas, and those present will know how this works, by allowing Asian immigrants to come into the country through ministerial discretion. Now... There were several Conservatives, including Billy Snedden, that said we don't want just ministerial discretion. If we're going to have qualified Asian people coming into the country, such as doctors and others, we need to put this into policy. We need to make this clear. But they wouldn't do it. Neither party would do it. Because, and this is the other side to this, both, both Menzies and Downer were committed to the white Australia policy. Everyone was. It was only the intellectuals and certain immigrant groups within the radical left elites of probably universities like this that were not going to uh, go along with the white Australian policy. So how do you change things? You do it incrementally. You introduce small things and then when the change comes, such as when Harold Holt in 1966 allowed uh, non-Europeans in for the first time, sort of made sense because it had been gradually being introduced, small changes, incrementalism. Incrementalism is authorisation and in the, inevitably builds a stronger, uh, a stronger polity, stronger uh, policy. Also, there were provisions within the Migration Act that uh, are down and removed, such as um, if you were um, suspiciously given a title of someone that should be removed, a bit like to today, you were put in prison. You're incarcerated. Now, Downer had spent five years in a Changi prisoner of war camp. He said, we're not having this. So he made detention centres the way to do it, got rid of prisons. Humanised. This is all humanising the policy, legitimising the policy. And it's probably, in talking about Alec Downer, George Ennis, it's probably a regretful thing to say that those years didn't help him in his service to Australia. He, di he died a relatively young man in 1981, giving service to his country in Changi and would have taken everything out of him. When he returned as from British High Commissioner from 64 to 72, um, and I do find this a funny phrase because we could talk about this in another paper, Zach, about the the fall of empire and the collapse of the Menzies' relationship with England in the 60s, was that the Conservatives called Alec, because he was so, so much in love with two soils, a violent Anglophile. He was described as a violent Anglophile because he loved the country so much. He was more Conservatives than the Conservatives. And that happened with a lot of Australians. A lot of Australians just could not see the end of empire. Alexander Downer describes him as a, as a son of empire. So all these different uh, legislation acts that we see moving forward 
uh, help to change a lot, if I can read my own quotes, um, of the reaction. Even the Murdoch press. Now, the Murdoch press in the 60s was actually pro uh, introduction of Asian immigration. Murdoch changed, a bit like the Democrats and the Republicans in the, in the 30s in the United States, from being a progressive to a conservative. Now, this quote here from, uh, from Down himself in 1963, a section of the press uh, fanned a, a campaign for an annual quote of Asian people. Newspapers such as the Melbourne Herald and those controlled by Rupert Murdoch constantly criticise my uh, refresh with strong cabinet concurrence to, I'm read my writing, to countenance such a dreadful expedient. In other words, I'm not going to allow Asians into the country. So you, we need to, this is a very complex issue. Uh, Migration Act of 1958 reforms to strengthen it. This is my argument. Both Menzies and Downer were reforming to strengthen the policy because they felt that Australia had become under a, a, a ridicule internationally and they wanted to improve the appearance of the policy to make it more humane and to make it more acceptable. This is complex. Did they want to get rid of it? No, they didn't. There was such a bipartisan commitment that even at the time they had different officials such as Secretary Hayes was very concerned that all these changes would produce outbursts of criticism. Gwenda Tavern argues that the, the strength of Downer was to make these issues more public, however, that he brought them out into the open to discuss. What was done was done previously by ministerial discretion surreptitiously to someone no one knew. There were Asian doctors coming into the countries in the 50s. There were, were Asians entering, but it was never, ever discussed because the, the people such as Secretary Hayes of the Immigration Department regarded as so politically damaging that they would not tell the public what was actually going on. In fact, Downer in the bill in 1958 says this, the purpose of the bill is to consolidate and amend Australia's immigration statutes. It has nothing to do with government's current immigration policy. Its primary concern is with the mechanism, that is the administration by which national policy is implemented. In other words, we're not changing things, we are humanising the process. Now, the reaction to all this was very difficult for... Um, for people within the, the Labor Party. And I want to um, go to a quote here. Firstly, with the abolition of the dictation test, the main opposition to doing it was from Labor. And I think this morning um, I heard Anne, Anne talking about Evett and um, how he was regarded. And there's someone else, I think our economist friend, talking about he wasn't was seen as self-assertive, uh, looking after his own future, not interested really in the Labor Party. He would have thought that Labor would have supported the abolition of, of the dictation test. This is a direct quote from Hansard, which I dug out. It took me years to dig it out, but I found it, and there it is. There is a quote from Evert. We must keep the dictation test in reserve. Really? We must keep the dictation test in reserve. In other words, if we find someone we don't like, we're going to exercise it on you. You won't be able to stay here because if you can't pass the test and speak English, you're out. This is Labor. This is not progressive Labor because old Labor, of course, is concerned with the economic battle about conditions and wages. It's not concerned about the woke agenda we see today. They're two different Labor parties. But this is quite um, a problem... And it's counterintuitive to understanding the struggle that uh, Alec Downer had in getting his legislation through. Because what happened was that Southern European immigration was being rejected by the, um, uh, by the Labor Party in 1958 and wanted to return to the previous situation. This is Clyde Cameron. Read this quote. Clyde Cameron, I'll let you read it because it's a bit hard from where I'm, where I'm sitting. But he said that we are no, lo no more are going to allow anybody who's not British than the Poles would allow people who weren't Poles. Clyde Cameron. So this is the British way of life, is the way of life we must have in Australia. We don't want any exceptions to this. He said we don't want poker dancing Central Europeans here. This is Labor in 1948. The opposition. Have you heard it before? 
When I wrote this, a leading Labor professor said to me, I've never heard it before. And he's probably the premier Labor historian in the country. You wonder why we don't hear these things. Well, who's writing the history? Who's winning the, um, the culture wars? Who's writing our cultural civilization? Are our children reading this in schools today, like we heard that brilliant fellow this morning? These are very important matters. They're critical to understanding our heritage and why people stand for a different way. But that quote from Cameron, all we do is ask that it should be implemented, the British way of life in its entirety, and on other, on other occasions appeal to the minister to ensure that, that migrants would be allowed into the country who were ignorant of what comprises the British way of life. So this is Britishness. It, Britishness knew no political party. As, my supervisor, Professor Greg Melish, taught me very early, Paul, Britishness is on both sides of the, of, the, of the fence and it's a very powerful force within policy. So, to sum up, um, the reactions to the policy, to the Migration Act, to reform, to change, to improve, um, were very difficult for, for Alec Downer. Uh, the, the bill was passed... He received uh, criticisms, but later when he wrote his, his reflections before his death in 1981, he said, I'm proud of the way that I've grown a greater Australia. Nation building is in my family's blood and it, it will remain the purpose of my administration. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 